Volodymyr Zelensky says Ukraine has begun what he calls an historic week. With fighting raging on in the Donbass, the Ukrainian president has predicted that Russia will likely intensify its attacks in the coming days. His warning comes as Kyiv awaits a landmark decision from European Union leaders on its bid for candidate status. Let's listen in on what Zelensky had to say. This week, we should expect greater hostile activity from Russia, and not only against Ukraine, but also against other European countries. We are preparing. We are ready. Let's go to DW correspondent Rebecca Ritters, who's uh, standing by for us in Kyiv. Uh, Rebecca, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky said on Sunday that he expects Russia to intensify attacks. What, what does he mean by that, do you think? Well, I think in Ukraine, he's talking about an intensification on the battlefield, something we have seen in the last couple of days. He may also be referring to other random attacks on cities not uh, on the front lines, perhaps Kyiv. Uh, you know, perhaps when, there was a similar attack when uh, Antonio Guterres, the head of the UN, visited uh, some weeks ago now. Uh, there was a, a, a one-off strike here in Kyiv, and everyone sort of took that to be a bit of a warning strike from Russia. When the three leaders uh, of Germany, uh, France and Italy came last week. Many were expecting something similar here in the capital. That didn't come to fruition. So there is perhaps something that President Zelensky is also referring to being possible uh, this week in particular. We know it's an important week when it comes to this uh, EU candidate status vote happening in the European Council. But he was also, of course, referring to uh, attacks on Europe. Now, when it comes to that, he'll no doubt be referring to a tightening of the gas supplies, which we've also seen uh, Russia doing in recent days or weeks um, on European countries, making the price of gas soar. It's really one of the only weapons he has against the West at the moment, but one that he's very prepared, as we see, to use. You're talking about the attacks that didn't occur, but one thing that Russia is doing is making claims about the Ukrainian army suffering heavy losses in, in, in considerable detail. What more do you know about that? Yeah, well, Russia has come out and said that it had a couple of successful attacks, uh, one on a bunch of army generals. It said that they were meeting uh, for, uh, for a meeting and that they were successfully attacked by Russian soldiers uh, and 50 casualties believed or reported by Russia. They also said that they hit an arms depot, uh, taking out quite a few of the international weapons that have been sent. But actually, uh, that hasn't been independently verified. And uh, Ukraine certainly hasn't come out acknowledging that. So we really don't know that's true. It seems unlikely, though, that 50 generals would be collected together at once or that all the arms would be stored in one area. They, stuff tends to get split up for situations just like this so that it's not all able to be taken out in one strike. OK, Rebecca Ritter is reporting for us from Kiev. Thanks very much. Top Ukrainian officials say they need a massive increase of military hardware if they are to drive Russian forces out of their country. Right now, Western allies have supplied Ukraine with just over 100 howitzers, just one-tenth of what Ukraine says it actually needs. And no rocket launchers have been arrived, even though Ukraine has asked for 300 of them. DW's Nick Connolly reports from the front lines in the southern Mykolaiv region, where Ukrainian forces have been struggling to keep Russian troops at bay. Russia may be making gains in the Donbass, but it's a different story here, 600 kilometers to the southwest in Mykolaiv. Ukraine is pushing Russian forces out of villages like these and closing in on the Russian-occupied city of Kherson. But Ukrainian commanders worry their advance could run out of steam, be stopped or even reversed. After more than 100 days of relentless fighting, their supplies of weapons and ammunition are running dangerously low. We meet Victor and his crew some way behind the front lines. When war broke out, they were all working abroad. All of them decided to give up their lives and safety in Poland and Germany to return home to fight. Victor found that little had changed since his time as a recruit in the Soviet army decades earlier. This howitzer is just old. It's way past its prime. We've been making the most of it, but what can you expect from a weapon built almost 50 years ago? Replacing it with something newer and more powerful is off the cards for now. 
but even carrying on fighting as they have been in recent months would be a challenge. Ukraine's supplies of Soviet ammunition are almost exhausted, and Western-produced shells aren't compatible. With Russian missile strikes a constant threat, producing weapons inside the country is near impossible, leaving Ukraine playing for time while it waits both for Western artillery and the shells to go with it. We have queues of people wanting to sign up to fight. We have more than our army can take on. But we just don't have enough weapons to equip everyone who wants to fight. Arming Ukraine is in Europe's very own interest, Victor tells us. He just can't understand why there seems to be so little urgency. We're fighting for all of Europe here. Putin won't be satisfied with taking Ukraine. If he wins here, he'll carry on and attack others. Ukraine is already paying a high price for being outgunned, with daily casualties running at several hundred a day. Victor tells us of a call he had to make recently, informing the parents of the youngest member of their unit that their 19-year-old son had been killed just weeks after he got to the front lines. He doesn't want to make many more calls like that, and he's convinced more Western weapons are the answer. Let's zoom out a bit now and talk to military analyst and former British Army officer Mike Martin. He's a visiting research fellow in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. Uh, Mike, thanks for joining us. There's a gap between what Western countries are promising, as we've been saying, and what's being delivered. Why? Well, some of those gaps are for good reasons. So, you know, if you're delivering artillery, there is a, you know, for example, you need to train the crews and that takes time, even if you compress the training courses down. But there's actually differences between different countries. Um, so quite a lot of the countries have delivered what they've promised. So, for instance, uh, the UK um, has, has promised about a billion euros and has delivered about a billion euros. Poland, similar, 1.5 billion. Um, Germany has promised 0.5 billion and has only delivered 0.2 billion. And I think that rather than there is, of course, a training gap, but there is I think there's probably two things in Germany. One is a sense of overcoming the historical political inertia. So Schultz uh, made his famous speech, but that takes time to feed into the system. And secondly, I think there's a feeling of bureaucracy taking over and delaying some of those weapons deliveries. And I'd just like to ask you a question about the claims Russia made over the weekend that it killed more than 50 Ukrainian generals and officers uh, on a, in an attack on a military meeting and took out as well 10 American howitzers. Um, does that seem plausible to you? No, um, that's completely implausible. Um, you... you uh, the, the highest value targets on any battlefield are the senior commanders because it takes 20 or 25 years for them to gain the experience to be able to run an entire battlefield. Um, they would never, ever be located in the same location together unless that location was the, the capital city of their own country. Um, they would never come together on Ukrainian territory like that. Just a, a question, if I may, about the policies that Western countries are having vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Um, there seems to be a bit of a division about how to, how to deal with Russia and perhaps how Ukraine should come to terms with Russia. Do you think uh, that's a problem in this conflict? I, I think it is, um, and, and this is feeding into uh, the weapons deliveries. In a sense, it is the, na the nature of an alliance. So NATO is an alliance of, of, of 30 or 40 countries. Um, but within that alliance, we have varying views on what the strategic goal should be for the West. So at one end, we have uh, the, the goal should be the defeat of Russia um, within Ukraine. So you, Russian forces must leave Ukraine. Um, next, we have we should be using uh, uh, Western weapons and Ukrainian troops in order to uh, bleed Russia. So to really make them pay and to degrade them as a military force. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have... Well, what we don't want to do is to have Ukraine lose. 
And you can see with those three different strategic outcomes, um, different countries are in different positions and within different governments. I think you find that some people are advocating for harsher measures and some are advocating for weaker measures. And it really takes a long time to get everyone on the same page. Although I have to say we have been fighting this war now for, for over three months and for the West not to have a united strategic goal is pretty poor. All right. Military analyst Mike Martins, thanks so much for that insight. Thank you.